Let's begin. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our eighth and final session of Lawyers as Leaders. And I'm grateful to each of you for taking this class. I'd like to begin by thanking the people who made this course possible. Uh, we have 13 TAs who uh, have helped put together each, each class as well as uh, providing you feedback. We've had eight amazing faculty members and Kelsey Levin Epstein has done extraordinary work you know, pulling everything together. Um, I particularly like to thank uh, Dean Sale. Uh, Dean Sale is one of the preeminent national experts on teaching leadership. Uh, she and Dean Ohm came up with the idea for this course in the spring. And in addition to suggesting our overall goals for the course, um, she worked with the TAs and me to organize and think through each session and what we would try to bring out. So I'd like to especially thank her. We would not have had this course without her. And um, this is a historic course. Among other things, this is the course with the largest enrollment in the history of Georgetown Law. So we're 150 years. Um, I'm, I'm uh, doing this Zoom class from my son's room and I've got the 150 banner behind me. Uh, and we've never had a class of this size. Um, and it's been getting a lot of attention because there's a recognition that law schools need to be teaching leadership. And if you didn't see the Washington Post article about this course, I hope you go online and look at it. And I'm very proud to be part of it with you. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed each speaker and learned from all of them about the tension between the rule of law and norms and the importance of recognizing the difference. Although you're all studying law and we're in the business of teaching it to you, law is limited in its ability to do everything you might want. The law is only one means of take, making change. Those of us who are committed to change do it by leaning in, taking risks, making mistakes, and then leaning again. And that message has come through in every session. And I know it will in this one as well. Couple of logistics. I want to remind you about the paper draft and final deadlines, as well as the peer review process. Uh, your first draft for peer review is due on Canvas Friday, November 20th. That's this Friday at noon Eastern time. It's imperative that you submit this assignment on time in order for the peer swap to be a success. You have until Monday, November 23rd at noon to return your comments to your peer. And then your final draft due via Canvas a week later, Monday, November 30th at noon Eastern. And if you have any questions, please be in touch with your TA. I'm looking forward to today's discussion with Professor Henning as we explore these topics. And I have to say, you know, we've had eight great sessions and I think it's really terrific and in so many ways appropriate that we're ending with Professor Henning's insights. Uh, I'd like to recognize Dylan Brown, Brown, TA, who did a terrific job helping organizing today's session and, and bringing everything together. So thank you very much, Dylan. So let me begin uh, by introducing Professor Henning. Uh, Kristen Henning is the Bloom Professor of Law, and she's the director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic, an initiative at Georgetown Law, where she supervises law students and represents youths accused of delinquency in the DC Superior Court. She has served as the Law Center's Associate Dean for Experiential Education, and it was such a privilege to work with her in that, in that uh, role. And she currently serves as my Special Advisor on Community and Justice. Professor Henning was previously the Lead Attorney for the Juvenile Unit of the DC Public Defender Service, and she's currently the Director of the Mid-Atlantic Juvenile Defender Center. Professor Henning writes extensively about race, adolescence, and police, policing, with her work appearing in multiple journals and books. She's also the editor of an anthology, Rights, Race and Reform, 50 Years of Child Advocacy in the Juvenile Justice System. And she's writing a book forthcoming with Penguin Random House about the criminalization of black adolescents and the intersection of race, adolescence and policing. Professor Henning has trained state actors across the country on the nature and scope of implicit racial bias and how it operates in the juvenile and criminal legal system. Her workshops help uh, stakeholders recognize their own biases and develop strategies to counter it. 
Professor Henning also worked closely with the MacArthur Foundation's Juvenile and Indigent Defense Action Network to develop a 41 volume juvenile training immersion program, a national training curriculum for juvenile defenders. She now co-hosts with the National Juvenile Defender Center, an annual week-long JTIP Summer Academy for Defenders. In 2019, she partnered with the Juvenile Defender Center to launch a racial justice toolkit for youth advocates. And in 2020, she launched the Ambassadors for Racial Justice Program, a year-long program for juvenile defenders committed to challenging racial injustice within juvenile legal system. President Henning serves as, on the board of directors for the Center for Constitutional for Children's Law and Policy. She served as an expert consultant on juvenile justice to a number of state and federal agencies, including the DOJ Civil Rights Division. And she was a reporter of the ABA Task Force on Youth and the Juvenile Dep and Dependency Systems. She's the recipient of many honors, including the Robert Shepard Award for Excellence in Juvenile Defense, the Shannara Gilbert Award from the American Association of Law Schools for a Commitment to Justice on behalf of children. She's been selected to the American Law Institute and appointed as an advisor to the ALI's Restatement of Children. Uh, Professor Henning received her BA from Duke, a JD from Yale, and an LLM from Georgetown Law. So we're just delighted that you're joining us today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Happy to be a part of this. Well, we're just so really, it's really such a privilege to be able to talk to you. So um, so let me start um, by talking about uh, your career and your biography. So you made a career in criminal defense and in particular defending children accused of crime. How did you end up there? So, um, Bill, I think it's really a combination of um, values and commitments um, that were instilled in me from birth um, before I even realized it. Um, and then followed by like, a series of very clear aha moments um, that really solidified um, my commitment and helped me articulate what I was going to do with my life. Um, you know, within childhood, I come from a very large extended family that cared a lot about justice. Uh, my father and his siblings, my aunts and uncles, um, very much grew up in the civil rights era um, and went to marches and, and were engaged in various forms of activism. Um, and so I also was connected to a very large extended family um, that had very deep roots in the African American church, and in particular in the, the leadership of the Black church. Um, and so that included volunteering with young people both in and outside of um, that church space. My mom was a professor of early childhood psychology and um, my family, both my immediate family and my extended family were very explicit in teaching us um, and talking about poverty and what poverty meant in America. So I, you know, really one of the most, um, uh, the earliest defining moments I had around sort of issues of poverty in America came when I was um, 16 years old. I remember it distinctly. So I grew up in a small town in um, the South um, and I had just gotten my driver's license when one of my aunts came to visit. Um, and she said to me, okay, you've got your car now. You've, I mean, you, you've got your driver's license now. Um, and so take me on a tour of the city. Um, and she said very, very clearly, I don't wanna see the big houses. I don't wanna see the rich part of town. I don't wanna see the pretty buildings. I want you to show me the housing projects. Um, and she just wanted to see in our city, you know, where people have limited money and have limited resources. Um, and so I you know, grew up in a, you know, a middle-class neighborhood, um, but to have my aunt say to me, now I want you to, to get in your, get in the car and drive to this, uh, to the public housing um, and talk on the way there. And while we were there, do you understand what you are seeing and how will you use your life? How will you use your career to do something about that? Um, and so I really began thinking about um, poverty and indigent, um, rep, you know, working with indigent folks very, very early on. Um, and I think a second real aha moment came for me as a freshman. 
um, in college. And I uh, wrote about that actually in the chapter that I shared with the students in this course. Um, and that was being a freshman in college and having a legal internship in North Carolina in a prosecutor's office and literally watching children walk down the hall handcuffed to one another, chained you know, at their arms, chained at their feet, chained around the belly. Um, and I just was, I was literally shocked and mortified that this is how we treat children in contemporary America. So now you've got these two things happening. I'm thinking about poverty, I'm thinking about children. And then I think a third moment that really brought it all home as to what I was gonna do with my career was actually my first year in law school. Law school, yet another aha moment. Um, I knew when I got there that I wanted to participate in a clinical program. I had heard a lot about clinics um, and my law school had clinics that represented kids in abuse and neglect, special education matters and in immigration matters. But at the time there was no delinquency clinic. Um, and for me, it really was sort of a microcosm of what I was beginning to see in the rest of the world, um, which was that folks were eager, lawyers were eager to work with what we call the sad kids, kids who had been wronged by the state or wronged by the system in some way. Um, but but the lawyers were less interested in working on behalf of what they call the bad kids kids, kids who had done something wrong. Um, and so I asked my clinical professors in law school, can we start picking up some delinquency cases? Can we start representing kids in delinquency court? And they said, yes, um, and we did. Um, and it became very, very clear to me almost immediately that the kids we were representing in delinquency court were very much the same kids that we were representing in those abuse and neglect and special education cases. Um, and it just, um, at that moment, I knew I both wanted to be a criminal defense attorney and that I wanted to specialize um, really in representing kids sort of in the deep end of, of the system, so. And then how did you decide uh, to become an academic? So, um, you know, I think after representing a uh, client, so I ended up after law school doing uh, the Prettyman Fellowship as a two-year fellowship, and then I went to the DC Public Defender Service, two really phenomenal offices for, um, for you know, learning and training how to be a great public defender. And, um, but after doing that work for a, a long time, um, Bill, even, even just a few years, to be quite frank, um, it is hard to continue to do the work without wanting to blow up the system. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, maybe a little bit of hyperbole, but you really, um, particularly in my case, practicing in the District of Columbia, um, I um, have been representing kids in delinquency cases for about 26 years. Um, and in that entire time, I have only had four white clients. That is it. Um, and one of those clients um, wasn't even technically my client. Um, actually, he was being represented by a law firm and the law firm really needed some local uh, assistance, you know, somebody with some expertise in juvenile court. And another one of those four white clients actually technically was wasn't even white, he was Egyptian um, who presented as white. So the reality is I'm talking two white kids in 26 years um, in a city like the District of Columbia that clearly isn't, you know, 99% white by any stretch of, uh, black, excuse me, um, by, by any stretch of the imagination. And so it's mind boggling, to be honest with you, um, to walk into court every day and to only see uh, black kids, very few Latinx kids, though they are there. Um, and so the answer to the question is how did I end up in the academy is I really wanted to figure out how to have a greater impact on reform. How did I, how do I want to, you know, get us to, to pause and think about how we could have such extreme racial disparities. Um, and so for me, clinical teaching is absolutely the perfect fit. Um, I still get to represent clients. Um, I'm in teaching though and engaging with law students, um, really developing a cadre of young lawyers who will either, um, you know, be defenders or legal aid lawyers or um, politicians or even go to law firms, but all of those spaces in which they can affect change. Um, also in the academy, I had time to stop um, and research and write um, a time for policy work, um, um, literally lobbying and the like, um, and then just opportunities to do some training um, to defenders across the country and other stakeholders um, really across the country. And so that's really why I left public defender work to come to the academy. 
I have to say the the fact that you've only had four white clients in all those years is really shocking. It really is, and, and you just you don't even think about it. Um, you know, in a city like D.C., it's just it's just unimaginable, really. Um, and of course, I got to say those disparities exist uh, across the country. You know, to varying degrees. I mean, um, and and the, the population, the disparate population, looks different depending on what part of the country you're in. It might be an overrepresentation of indigenous peoples or an overrepresentation of Latinx, but the disparities are everywhere. Um, but yes, D.C. four white clients in 26 okay. years. Wow, wow. So, um, but I think, you know, you know, talking about kind of your aha moments mm -hmm. uh, and the way that led you to first the public defenders and then into teaching. You know, one of the things that, um, that I've tried to do in this course is, you know, as you reflect on first jobs and the start of your career, um, is there any particular advice that you'd give our law students about how you think about your first job and your second job and you know how you want to begin yeah i think that's a great question um i came to to think about the first years out of law school as really a time of service and a time of growth um and and so what does that look like i think um it was important for me to work in a sort of legal aid slash public defender kind of space as a young lawyer while i still had the stamina <laughs> to, to be quite frankly to do it um you know day in and day out um before you get married before you have kids before you have to pay a mortgage all of those traditional things it's a really good time um to be of service um i also you know i think of the law degree as a privilege. Um, and so the, the first years out of school was a great time uh, to give back to indigenous communities. Um, and also too, I mean, thinking about uh, direct services um, as, as a way of learning at, at a pretty fast pace. Um, you know, the, the second thing about thinking about what like a first job looks like um, is looking for a job that reminds me that law is about people, right? And that law is about the impact that um, uh, it has, or, or we really want to think about law and the impact that it has on few on people. And I think that um, there are few things that drive that concept home, like direct representation, like being on the ground and seeing how um, the law, um, you know, both common law and you know legislation impacts real people. Um, it, it's really um, a wonderful way to see it in that type of legal aid, public defender space. Um, and I think you know, policy specialists. There's a policy specialist inside the DC Public Defender Office. And what I love about them and what I learned so much from them when I was at the Public Defender Service is they would never push or advocate or oppose a piece of legislation without meeting extensively with the line attorneys um, who were, you know, uh, who could talk about um, uh, what impact the law might have on their clients. And so that was just, I, I, I think that's one way to think about it. Um, uh, is service um, and learning. Um, it's not the only way to think about it, but for me, it was very, very useful. And then how do you, uh, so you've talked about starting the public defender <coughs> and moving to academia. You know, how, how should people think about kind of the, the total arc of their career? Is that something you, you start to think about at the beginning? Is it something that changes? Because you're actually, you know, it, it sounds very much like almost your career had a, a focus really from the start of law school. Yeah, no, I, I, and I will say this, because I say this to students all the time. I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm one of the lucky ones that I knew really early on, almost going into law school, that I wanted to work in a public interest space, that I wanted to, to have something to do with children. And I eventually, pretty quickly, probably within you know uh, the first couple of years, knew that it was going to be criminal defense. So I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, but I think in terms of an arc, um, I think about my arc was from direct services 
to policy reform, and then really um, transformation. And so when I talk about transformation is I can, how can I transform values? How can I transform stakeholders and the way stakeholders think about uh, the law? So what impact can I have on, on judges, on prosecutors, on defenders, right? Um, in terms of, of systems reform. So um, I think all of those pieces were, uh, were you know, have, have evolved or appeared in, in various stages, um, you know, of, of my career. I think the other thing about the evolution of career is that most of our early jobs that we go into are jobs that are readily available to us, right? We can walk into a law firm and do pro bono work. We can walk into a public defender work, uh, of public defender office and have mentors and clients. Um, but there comes a point at which we've got to create space. We've got to create something new. We've got to create new opportunities. And so, you know, we talked a moment ago, uh, or you mentioned in talking about the work that I do um, with the ambassadors for racial justice. So it's, it's not enough to just be in those traditional spaces, but how can I begin to think outside the box? And so our ambassadors for racial justice program is designed to bring together a core group of juvenile defenders across the country who will think intentionally about how to transform the system um, with regard to, to racial justice. Um, and it really requires us to think outside the box um, and, and, and to try new ideas and conceive of new ideas. So I think that's what sort of I hope I am now um, in my career is, is outside the traditional spaces and looking at, at, at ways to, to, to reform. That's, I mean, that's, I think that's terrific guidance and advice. Um, so let me, a couple to let now let's uh, move to a number of leadership questions and specific questions that the students have asked. Um, so let me start with the book. Uh, your book is being published by Penguin Random House. Uh, I know you're still finalizing the title. Tentative title is Arresting Development, How America Criminalizes Black Adolescents. So why did you decide to write this book and, and what's your goal? So um, I guess a place to start is, is with the theme that I know I've already said since we've been talking, which is this notion that the law is about people and about the impact um, that you know, uh, the laws that we make have on people. Um, and so I, I think the first thing is to drive that point home. Um, you know, in my case, every legal decision, you know, we make is about black teenagers, it's about their families, it's about um, black communities, um, the choices we make about what behaviors are crimes and what uh, uh, criminal laws we're going to enforce against whom um, uh, has far reaching ripple effects um, on not only the black community, but beyond that. Um, and so I think one of the messages that I wanted to drive home was just that. And so really trying to weave together the stories that my students in the clinic over the years have had um, with our clients, um, uh, really weaving that together with the, the data, with social science research, with the law, um, to get us to understand in a lot of ways that over-policing um, has become what they call iatrogenic or criminogenic, like we're increasing crime instead of reducing crime um, and having extraordinary impact on people's lives and not getting the, the return um, on, that, uh, on that policing. So that's one thing. I think the other reason for writing the book is to really explore something that I'm not sure we've explored very well as a community, and that is the unique intersection of race, adolescence, and policing. Um, we know so much more um, about adolescent development than um, <clears throat> we have ever um, you know, known over the last 25 years, sort of um, adolescent development as a discipline, a unique uh, narrow discipline of psychology, as a unique narrow discipline of neurology has, been, has become uh, increasingly important. Um, and it has had a significant impact on the Supreme Court's evolving jurisdiction on cruel and unusual punishment. Punishment um, for children. And so I really wanted to marry that research um, and marry that law with what we now know about race and implicit racial bias as a cognitive science. Um, and so thinking about how that intersection 
of, of adolescence and race might affect current policing practice. And for us to use all of that knowledge to think about a way um, forward. So I wanted this book to be a conversation. I hope you know uh, this book will be a conversation starter um, for policy reform um, and tell a story that folks actually don't know. Um, and I got to say, it's been an extraordinary experience for me. I've been doing the work for a long time. And to really dig into the, the research on the psychological trauma of policing on adolescent development has been fascinating. It's a body of, of study that I didn't know and that most of our defenders um, that I train across the country um, didn't know. Um, and then I, I want the book to, to change the culture, um, to change the narrative right, to create aha moments for other people, and particularly the aha moment that Black children are children too. Um, and so at the end of the day, I hope those aha moments will really influence key decision makers um, about the juvenile and criminal legal system, um, or key decision makers within, I should say, the, the criminal legal system, the police officers themselves, the judges, prosecutors, defenders, um, the community, you know, community education. Um, so. So, and, and I, you know, I think it's one of the things that's so powerful is the way you have both kind of the narratives of, you know, specific injustices that people have suffered and, you know, the fitting it into, you know, a range of scholarly literature. And, and it's really the combination is so, so powerful and very convincing. Um, so let me, uh, there are a couple of student questions that I want to draw on really to follow up on what you just said. Uh, one student writes, what can be done on an individual level within our communities to help counter the bias you've described in your book? How can we best be allies to the Black community in the face of discrimination in the criminal justice system? Yeah, so um, I think that's a hard question, um, but an important one and one that I'm glad you asked. Um, the, look, I would say the first thing that every person has to do on an individual level is resist and challenge assumptions and stereotypes. Um, and I'm talking about your own stereotypes and assumptions that you have um, about uh, black youth, black uh, children in, in, or black people in general, but certainly about black youth. And I think we all have a responsibility to hold each other accountable um, for those, um, uh, for breaking those biases. And so how do we start thinking about doing that? You know, um, one of my heroes is Brian Stevenson and he talks about proximity, right? So how do we get ourselves in proximity um, uh, to, to communities that we know little about um, and that communities that, you know, we have been afraid of or have stereotypes and assumptions about um, through mentoring, um, through teaching, um, through doing pro bono work, if you uh, you know go to a law firm or um, choosing your way at least for two years maybe into um, some sort of legal services um, uh, office that allows you to get proximate um, with with communities of color and, and and you know for my purposes with Black youth in in particular, we've got to educate ourselves. We've got to correct our errors. Um, some of you, many of you, will be parents. You've got to raise your children. <laughs> this sounds so trite, but it's so true. You've got to raise your children to love and respect and engage with all races. Um, and that's really, really critical. Um, you know, and I think uh, often about what can we do to break the bias habit. It's about um, perspective taking, right? Putting yourselves in the shoes of some of the young people that I write about, right? Um, finding the, the commonality. Um, I talk a lot about criminalizing normal adolescence, you know, remembering what it was like to be an adolescent um, and your race and your class and your station in life doesn't change the basic trajectory of, of adolescent development. So remembering what it was like to be a child. Um, it's about imagining and assuming that every person you meet on the street um, is or has the potential um, to be everything that you are and everything that you can be, teacher, lawyer, writer, business owner, all of that. So, um, and then, you know, I would say the last sort of strategy for breaking some of these bias habits is about individual, what we call individuation, remembering that no one is the sum total of any one of their demographics, right? So, you know, um, a black person is not just, you know, a black person, <laughs> you know, a woman is not just a woman, but we are the sum total of all of those things. Um, and then, you know, once you break your own bias habits or begin to, it's a lifetime process. You got to speak out, um, challenge uh, those assumptions where you see other people making them. 
Um, so that's those are some some minor things. I think on the legal and 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 political level, each one of us is a um, is a voting member of society. We've got to pay attention to local politics, um, like DA elections, um, judicial elections for, for in those states where judges are elected. Um, so there's there's a, a a lot that we can do at the individual level as well. So now um, you know you've seen the questions that the that were submitted and. Uh, your book sparked debate among the students, starting with one student who asked the question. I uh, wrote, or she wrote, in my neighborhood, there's been a recent spate of violent crime, muggings, car jackings, beatings. All the perpetrators have been black youth. Why should I, my wife and my children not be scared of black youth? Yeah. Um, students reached out uh, and said that another student said they found the question racist and offensive. So and I'm, I'm sure this isn't the first time you received this question or heard the sentiment. So how do you respond and how do you help students think about how to answer this question? Yeah, no, it's a very, um, you know, difficult uh, um, and painful question. I'll be quite frank, uh, frank with you. Um, you know, I think I, my first thought is, look, we all want to be safe, right? We all want to protect our families. Um, and our fears grow out of our own lived experiences. Um, and so we've got to be thoughtful, you know, about what safety me measures that we take when we live in any urban environment. But having said that, we also have to be exceedingly careful about the assumptions, uh, the assumptions and extrapolations that we are making from uh, a pretty narrow pool of information that we have. So for example, I mean, if you've got um, five black kids are arrested um, in my own neighborhood in a very short span of time, I have to be careful not to assume that all black children therefore must be bad and dangerous. Um, and therefore I must be afraid and have my guard up for all black children. Um, I mean, that's a really dangerous, you know, um, a logical framework. Um, and the next logical framework is, is so, okay, so now I'm going to teach my children to be afraid of Black kids, you know, either implicitly or explicitly from the things that I do and the things that I say in front of my children. So it's really faulty. It's a really harmful logic in so, you know, many ways. I mean, I think starting with the assumptions that are laden in the question about guilt and innocence and culpability, um, the assumptions that are made about the accuracy of the witness accounts and the accuracy of the police investigation, um, assumptions that are made about the absence of mitigation and justification defenses, but I don't wanna get stuck there. And in fact, um, I, I don't wanna spend any of my time talking about sort of the factual guilt or innocence, because I think that's secondary to the bigger problem. I think the bigger, you know, uh, I don't wanna, you know, bigger concern is probably the word that I should use, um, is, is about um, our willingness to make meaning out of these incidents, these time limited incidents, um, and the, the concerns and the fears that we allow ourselves to indulge in um, as a result of these incidents. Um, and so I ask, you know, I wanna, I really wanna flip it back, right? Um, Bill, and think about it this way you know, uh, asking uh, students or asking folks who ask me this question, because you're absolutely right, you're, um, that's not the first time I've heard the question. It's if you were to walk into um, a wealthy middle-class suburban high school in Connecticut or Colorado, would you be afraid of every white child who walks past you? No, of course not. Despite the fact that the majority, if not all of mass school shootings have been committed by white youth um, in sort of middle-class neighborhoods. Um, looking at another example um, where the incidence of crime is higher, um, if you move to West Virginia or some other state that has been severely impacted by the opioid ep epidemic, are you gonna be afraid of every white kid who you see on drugs, um, afraid that they're gonna rob you or steal from you um, um, to feed their drug habit? No, of course not. We actually don't make those kinds of leaps um, with white kids, right? So the fears that we have about black children are deeply impacted by racial bias. Um, and you know the, the, this body of cognitive uh, science on implicit biases shows a very strong link between race and crime. Um, it's so strong, they call it bi-directional, meaning that whenever you think of crime, you think of black people. When you think of black people, you think of crime. And it's a very, very dangerous um, fallacy. So we always have to be on guard for these kinds of biases that we have. If we're not thinking critically um, about what our blind spot biases are, then we're gonna really make some bad policies like increasing stop and frisk, bad policies around severe sentencing of black children. Um, we're gonna have some really poor outcomes 
um, for the health um, and the success for Black children, the psychological trauma that I'm talking about, the trauma from racial stereotyping, the trauma from implicit biases and microaggressions. So every time, you know, we walk down the street and we visibly shrink away from a Black child, right, or appear to be afraid in front of a Black child, you're creating trauma and teaching that Black child that everyone around them um, uh, thinks that they are a danger. And you're teaching people who are watching you um, to be afraid of Black children. And the, the the research shows that we're doing nothing to improve uh, public safety um, uh, for all of the reasons that we, we talked about. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, we've just, we've got to be careful. Um, we've got to think about um, how far we allow our own experiences of crime in our neighborhood. Um, we tend to think that um, crime is on the rise. Um, and I think implicit in what I hear um, in that question is, uh, is, you know, is, is that I'm afraid in my city and when crime happens, I believe that crime is on the rise and therefore we've got to act fast and get our city to do something about it. Um, and that's exactly what happened. You know, Bill, I think we know this, um, was, you know, studying history, that's what happened in the 90s. We had a temporary spike, you know, in crime in the 1990s due to, you know, uh, the crack epidemic. Um, that was really time limited and it led to some really scary predictions about a black young super predators coming that never actually materialized. Um, it, you know, and yet we, we got a lot of bad law after that. Um, we had you know, a rapid increase in youth transfer laws. We adopted juvenile life without parole. We adopted blended sentence scheme, screen, uh, uh, schemes, all kinds um, uh, of really bad policy for all kids and not just black kids. Um, and then what it turns out, research quickly showed that even though the 90s saw a quick spike in crime, it was already um, headed down and crime plummeted in America in the years after that. Um, and so uh, it just, it, it's just, it's really uh, important to think about how far um, we're willing to go. I think the last thing I do wanna say on this is that, th that I think these questions, I, I always assume when I get a question like this, I just assume that the person is asking me for understanding, meaning that they are genuinely seeking to understand. So, and I have to approach it that way. Um, but folks also need to understand how extraordinary, extraordinarily painful, I think, and harmful questions like that are for the recipients and for the people who hear those questions. Uh, and I think as a Black woman, it's sort of a, a, a kick in the gut um, to hear, you know, questions um, that suggest the, the assumptions that are being made about young Black children. And so I ask you to think of it this way. Think about every Black mother, every Black father, every Black grandmother who's raising a Black child now and has to live with the fear and the agony that their children are being singled out and ostracized and feared because of the actions of a small number of children who do commit crimes, right? Um, and that white children are being raised and taught to fear and distrust Black children because of the actions of a few. So, um, and then finally, what it must be like to be a Black child <laughs> and know that you're being targeted and, and, and feared. So the bottom line is that every one of us has to check our own biases um, um, and, and learn how to do that. Um, on our own. Um, and I appreciate all the students who spoke up in response, um, you know, accepting the question for what it was, um, but speaking up and, and appreciating uh, those folks who wanted us to, 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 you know, to think twice before we draw conclusions. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are very powerful points. Um, and I think, you know, one of the uh, parts of your, the book, which is, you know, about the way in which bias shapes Perception is when you talk about the the two, you know, adolescents with Molotov cocktails, um, and you know the the, the <coughs> adolescent is really subject to you know the criminal justice system and all its rigors, and the white adolescent is given special chemistry class. Yeah, I mean, and you know, Bill, that was another aha moment. It's so interesting you say that. It was a such an incredible aha moment. I was actually, you know, at a conference. I was at Yale. We were at a roundtable, ginormous criminal justice roundtable. And I literally told that story and someone walked up to me afterwards and, you know, that was their response. And I just was blown away. And I think that was probably the moment, um, though, albeit, mind you, it was years ago, that I wanted to start writing about the criminalization of Black adolescents, right? Mm -hmm. And that how we, we really think about those very adolescent behaviors um, in radically different ways. And so, yeah. So one of the students actually just wrote in right now um, 
Can you point us to resources for ourselves or that we can share with others to help expand our views on these issues of race, adolescence, and policing? Um, it's a really good question. Um, you know, what I want to do, I really want to like prepare, you know, a bibliography that I can send to folks to, to think about it. Um, uh, I think um, not enough people are writing in the area. I will say I can, you know, I hate to, you know, share my own work, um, but I have written previously, even before this book about the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors for those of you who are thinking about being prosecutors. So I wrote that article specifically with an eye towards what can you do um, as prosecutors. Um, you know, I've written also about, you know, sort of the reasonable black child, which we could, you know, potentially talk about later, which also begins to address these issues. Um, there are really great books actually more I think about it this is this is good um, I would recommend policing the black man um, which is an anthology by um, Angela Davis that's got some relevant chapters there um, James Foreman um, used to teach here at Georgetown Law School um, it's got some really good chapters in his book about um, about uh, Thurgood Marshall School, which is one of the charter schools here in DC and what those uh, children experience. His book is called Locking Up Our Own. Um, so I think all of the work done by the Equal Justice Initiative, particularly around the campaign against uh, juvenile life without parole, um, they've just got some really, really great work um, uh, there. Um, I think for those of you who are interested in Black girls in particular, I would, um, Monique Morris's book, um, Push Out. Um, so there, 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 there are things that you can read. There are things that you can, um, uh, uh, you know, look to to get educated on. And I'm happy to, you know, Bill, try to come pull together a nice annotated bibliography or a bibliography um, for, for folks who are interested. I mean, that would be great. And uh, if you could do that, we'll actually put it on the Canvas website, sure. this course, because I think that would be just an incredible resource. A um, couple of other questions that are uh, uh, that students have asked. One, another student has just written, how can we introduce uh, the openness of perspective and grace uh, for one another as we try to face the diversity of experience and understanding. So, yeah. So it's, you know, openness and grace. Grace is, I just, I gotta tell you, it's one of the themes that are in the book. So much so, one of my RAs said to me, Do you think you've overused the word grace? <laughs> So I had to do some editing to get it out. But I just think it's such, the, it's the right word. It's so powerful. Um, the, the, the sense is when I think about grace, it starts with understanding that black children are children too, right? Um, and that you, we, we will never get to a place of grace as long as we, what, what we call other, other people. If we look at people and see them as something different, it's, it really goes back to what I said earlier. You have got to look at every single person and assume that they already are or have the potential to be everything that you are, right? I also think you have to, um, you know, as whatever leadership roles all of you will assume, you have to engage um, with every black child as if they were your own child. Um, and by that, I mean, as it treat them as if they were your own child. Um, and that's really the only way to have policies that you would want your, your own children um, to be uh, subject to, right? Or laws that you would want your children to be subject to. So grace comes from um, understanding at the outset that, that you know, um, that black children are your um, are are just like your children, um, and it's a myth um, <laughs> that that we have been fed that black children are dangerous and violent and somehow different, and that their adolescent impulsivity and um, uh, recklessness is somehow any more violent, dangerous than those of white youth. So, so. Um... And again, I think you know the data that you have in your book is really is so powerful, you know, on on uh, you know really challenging biases. I mean, it's really uh, you know it's it's you know one of my kind of strongest takeaways 
Yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, it's, so this is, this is what's so interesting about the data, right? Is like when I go and train, this is the best way to think about it, is when I go train stakeholders, prosecutors, judges, defenders, I'm like, you know what? We know the data is bad, meaning that the disparities are real, right? But what happens is the, 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 the data becomes critical when you're telling stories. So it's the combination of the narratives. And you, you, you talked about this, Bill, earlier, but it's the, you've got to be careful. Um, I think telling narratives about the clients that I write about in the book, for example, are the most compelling way to get us to a place of grace and to get us to a place of understanding. But the pushback that I get is, well, you've chosen the outliers, right? Mm -hmm. You've chosen those scenarios um, that are at the extremes. And so the data is essential to situate those cases in the broader scheme. And so what the data shows is what we all know, that disparities start at the front end, at the place of arrest, they actually at the place of stop and frisk, um, and they carry through arrest and they carry all the way through um, uh, sentencing um, and, and, and really and post, uh, uh, post sentencing um, and that the disparities get deeper and deeper and deeper or, or larger and larger as you get deeper and deeper into the system. And so, you know, I just, I, I absolutely agree that the data is essential um, and the data must be paired with narrative so that we really understand. Um, um, so uh, one student writes, uh, do you encounter people with unconscious bias who you can't persuade that they have it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, how do you approach the quote, but I am not like that, unquote, people? Man, have I ever encountered them? Absolutely, unequivocally. And let me just say this, that I started doing, um, I, I am not an expert in cognitive sciences. I, um, you know, I, I think I sort of stumbled into this implicit bias, unconscious bias training world um, almost by fluke. And I'm gonna tell you how it started because I have been a long time trainer of defenders public defenders as, um, you know, as Dean Trainer indicated, I, you know, sort of helped develop this, this curriculum for training defense attorneys. After we finished this uh, 40 volume, it started off as a 40 volume <laughs> training, we realized that we really, uh, we would go out in the field and we would train using the curriculum. And some of the comments that we were getting from defense attorneys was jarring um, and all, and very much, um, uh, indicated that we had real problems with racial bias. So why do I tell the story? <laughs> well, it goes to the heart of, um, of blind spot bias. Everyone, think about it. Um, so defense attorneys um, are the folks who self-select themselves into a career <laughs> representing people of color who are overrepresented in the system, um, representing those most in need. It is jarring to think about defenders having bias. And so defenders really, um, at first, were the most resistant to this idea, wait, why do I have to take an implicit racial bias training? All I do is work with indigent you know, people of color. Um, and so I, I, I just found it amusing uh, because I actually got into the implicit bias training specifically <laughs> to work with defenders who, were, um, who believed that they didn't have it. So there's this, this idea called blind spot bias, the idea that everyone else is biased except me. Um, and, and that leaves people who are progressive and egalitarian and fully committed to racial equity, um, it, it leaves them to believe that they don't have bias. And in fact, the research shows we all do. Every single one of us does. So, so um, one question concerns um, diversifying actors as a response. So uh, a student writes, uh, one recurring recommendation to reduce inequalities in the criminal justice system is to have more diverse actors from the community at every point from police officers to the judge's bench. Is diversifying actors in the criminal justice system enough to affect meaningful change in what seems like a broken system? So, um, so I think my first answer is, look, does it matter? Yes, diversity matters. Is it the game changer? Is it the end all be all? The answer to that is no. Um, and so let me start or I guess my second point that I'll make is, I think that the bench, the bar, 
the police department should mirror the relative demographics of society um, as a sign that there is equal opportunity and respect for all voices. I think the absence of black and brown people in those very important decision-making spaces um, suggests that something is wrong with access in society. Something is wrong with opportunity um, um, and that there's a lack of, of respect or desire for diversity. Um, but I also think that what we need to be looking for is a diversity of experience, a diversity of perspective, a diversity of viewpoints, and not just adding, excuse me, people of color to your, your um, to your office to allow you to check off a box and to say that you hired someone. And it's not just about hiring uh, black and brown folks who make you feel good or make you feel comfortable or who validate, you know, your, your, um, you know, your, your privilege and your racism and, and, um, and the like. I think you need to invite people into these spaces or we need to make sure that that diversity includes people who will challenge or at least um, question the status quo. Um, so that's the first part of my answer. I think the second part of my answer is that we're mistaken if we think that diversity alone um, is the fix. There is more than enough evidence um, that diversity on the bench, the bar, and the police department is not enough. Um, research shows, looking at all the cognitive um, bias research that we've been talking about, um, uh, shows that everyone has biases, even intra-race biases, especially as it relates to crime. So I already talked about how, how strong that link is between this notion of, of, of criminality and blackness. And so all of us have it. Um, maybe you know uh, people of color have it to a lesser degree, um, but it's still there. Um, and then also, I mean, people, of color can be co-opted into to the same sort of narrow thinking about crime and public safety and how do we get to public safety. Um, we as a country have a very narrow thinking about policing as the only option available for safety. And we have been unwilling as a country to allocate resources and to think outside the box about how to you know ensure public safety without uh, policing. And so I think you know people of color you know buy into that. Um, and then finally, again, I will recommend to, to all of you, you know, James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, who talks about the Washington, D.C. and how Washington, D.C. has a black mayor and a black um, uh, judge and a, you know, a black uh, a po a chief of police um, at the time when he uh, was writing about. Um, and, and we still um, have court systems where I practice in where I have four white clients. Right. Um, and so James also was at the public defender service so that it wasn't um, racial diversity didn't get us, <laughs> you know, to those spaces. So that, that's a very important point. So it's um, so <laughs> both perspectives or so just in terms of moving forward. Actually, one thing I want to do is I want to kind of move to the national level in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about kind of the national level and, you know, if there, you know, if this is a moment in which we can move forward. Uh, and which our votes are. So we have a new president. Right. Um, are you hopeful? And what do you want to see uh, the new administration do about race, adolescence, and policing? Um, so, you know, say <laughs> your question was, am I hopeful? Um, so I say all the time, I live on hope and optimism. Um, and it's a very personal thing to me. Otherwise, I don't see any reason to get out of bed <laughs> every day. Um, so yes, I am hopeful. Um, that said, I'm also realistic. Um, I think this season has been um, a wake up call um, so for so many you know, reasons. I think we've seen um, you know, uh, an increase in overt racism, um, racist acts, racist um, remarks. Um, since the 2016 election, I think um, you know, the, the killing of George Floyd was extraordinarily um, a powerful moment. I think this very tense um, and fraught uh, presidential election, um, you know, shows us a couple of things. It shows us that, um, you know, what's happening in our country is not limited to who holds office. It's the fact that we live in a nation um, that has a lot of people <laughs> um, that think that, you know, Black folks are a threat, um, a physical threat, 
um, a threat to the well, the economic well-being for the rest of the country. And so I think that the first thing I want to say in response to your question about the presidency is that I think work has got to be done on the state level and at the individual level. Um, but that said, um, what can the White House do? Yes, I am hopeful that the White House and who occupies the White House um, makes a difference. Um, I think number one, you know, the White House sets the tone both in terms of messaging and also in terms of incentivizing reforms. Um, and I, I think my work in the juvenile justice space, I learned a lot about um, what the federal government can do with incentive grants. Um, and so for example, you know, there are so many police officers in schools, the whole cops in schools, school resource officers all over the country um, grew as fast as they did because the federal government allocated millions of dollars to the effort, right? They said, hey, states, um, I'll give you X amount of dollars if you invest in school police partnerships. Um, also in the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, um, the, there are incentive grants tied to that that look specifically at disproportionate minority contact. And they said, hey, states, we'll give you money. If, and this is in a good way, right? So we'll give you money if you um, use uh, the funds that we give you to reduce your disproportionate minority contact in the juvenile uh, legal system. Well, then lo and behold, the most recent administration came along and said, okay, you can't use any of our incentive money, for example, for racial bias training in the juvenile and criminal legal system. You can't, so they put restrictions on. They also significantly rolled back the, the requirements for disproportionate minority contact um, that were the previous requirements through the incentive grants. So I say that because I think it's a powerful example of how the White House or the federal government and the, 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 the administration can have a direct impact on the state level. Um, I think, you know, federal laws have far less impact on uh, state courts, state criminal courts in particular, and particularly state juvenile courts. But here's one example of messaging. Um, so folks may remember that Khalif Browder committed suicide um, uh, after um, having been uh, held in, Rikers Island in New York for three years for an offense he absolutely did not do. Um, uh, and, it was, and spent most of that time in solitary confinement. And so in the wake of his death, President Obama um, uh, you know, sort of led and encouraged his administration to pass federal law banning solitary confinement. Well, the, of course that federal law only applies to federal prisons um, and there are very few children in federal prisons, but the point was that it sent a message to the states that you should replicate. So you ask, you know, what can the, you know, what can the White House do? What can the federal government do? I think, you know, uh, incentive grants, federal laws, judicial appointments matter. Um, I might shoot myself if I, need a, I see another task force, but yet, you know, presidential task force on the 21st century policing, they make a difference. Um, and so those are, those are some ideas. I think you also asked me, what do I want you know, them to do around, um, you know, policing in particular. Um, I think, you know, I think maybe I've answered that with some of the thinking around incentivizing, uh, reversing all of those incentive grants about police and schools to do something different. How about we incentivize creative alternatives um, to, to safety in schools, um, something short of policing in schools. Um, so actually one of the, so one of the questions on, on policing in schools yeah. Uh, student writes, given that the data shows that police presence does not prevent school violence, do you believe we will see police free schools nationwide in our lifetime? Oh, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, okay, so did I just say I live on hope and optimism? <laughs> uh, you know, that would be great. I don't know that we will see police, you know what, I think a realistic answer is no, we won't see police free schools across the country. But what we have already seen, and I'm very pleased, is that we've already seen some momentum on the police free schools movement. So folks, you know, you asked about what can you read? I think there's a ton of great work coming out of the advancement project. And they've long um, had a police free schools movement. And all of a sudden, George Floyd, you know, gets killed killed and we all see it on national TV and lo and behold the floodgates open you saw I mean many I mean within days 
of, of that killing. Um, you know, Minneapolis uh, school board um, voted to remove um, police from schools. We've, we had Oakland, California, which had been advocating, students had been lobbying and advocating for police-free schools for days, um, I mean, for years, excuse me. Um, and it happened after, um, after that. Um, there are a number of places um, that finally got traction um, on the police free schools movement um, after that. Do I think it's going to carry across the country? No, um, but I, I, I do hope that we will have some schools, number one, that the schools, even let's say take Oakland, for example, who will use this moment to come up with some effective strategies to achieve routine, to maintain routine school discipline and to ensure school safety without policing. And so that um, we have models, that's what we need. We need models for other jurisdictions to follow. We need to have um, jurisdictions that remove police officers and are able to demonstrate that crime doesn't go up. So that means we've got to invest in alternatives, right? Like, you know, um, positive behavioral interventions, you know, mediation, um, a crisis intervention specialists, counselors, what I'm saying, I should start there, mental health counselors on site instead of police officers. So I think this is a moment um, for us to, to hopefully uh, take advantage of the opportunity to get some good models in place that can be replicated across the country. So uh, moving beyond uh, police in the schools to more broadly policing. So one of the students writes, there's a lot of discourse surrounding defunding or abolishing the police. Uh, do you believe that meaningful reform would be possible or is defending defunding abolition the only way to fix systemic problems? Um, so that is the that is the question of the day, right? So I think there are, you know, I, I, I'm sure many of you know this, that there are great op-eds in the Washington Post by our very own um, Professor Christy Lopez on, you know, what defunding and abolition really mean. I know that Paul Butler in this leadership course has already spoken to you about this um, as well. So let me add, you know, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I think that, yes, some people do genuinely believe that we should completely defund and abolish the police because they don't see any other way out of the conundrum that we're in. Um, but I think really the majority um, of folks who use that term or use those terms don't mean full abolition. abolition. Um, and they don't actually mean full defunding. Um, and instead, what they really want us to do is to think about reimagining when and how we use police and for what purpose we use police in our society. Um, I think they also want us to think critically about um, how we might achieve our goals and objectives in other more effective ways. One of the primary goals for policing is, um, you know, is public safety, but are we actually achieving that goal? Um, and I think, um, you know, policing adolescence is a perfect way to think about it. Um, I personally am in favor of what I call radically reducing the footprint of police officers in the lives of young people and particularly of black young people, right? Um, and so, um, there are some obvious ways to get there. We've already talked about the police free um, schools movement. Um, and, the, you know, the police free schools movement, I should stop and say, um, also doesn't mean that police will never be available to help, you know, students or to, to prevent crime in school. Um, what we're saying is that we don't want police officers involved in the day to day routine discipline of children. We don't want police officers. Uh, criminalizing normal adolescent behaviors that white children are allowed to engage in with far less consequences. Um, and that's exactly what happens when we have police on pres uh, present on campus. As long as they're present, teachers and staff are gonna rely on them and not be creative about thinking of these alternatives. Um, but at the same time, you know, we want schools to be safe. Um, and I think we keep forgetting um, that police officers on campus actually have not prevented the mass shootings. And we also keep forgetting that 911 still does work, <laughs> right? And so if there is a major act of, of crime, a real crime, right? Or a crime that really needs police intervention, police departments are in very close proximity to most public schools or most schools all across the country and can get there within a matter of seconds. And so all of a sudden we, we just don't seem to be uh, able, um, we forgot that we can get there another way. Um, so, so, you know, I think 
defunding and abolishing is really about reimagining. Um, I think another way that we reduce the footprint of police in the lives of black children, for, for example, is a legislative fix, mm -hmm. literally decriminalizing much of what we have criminalized, right? So at least for adolescents. So recognizing that adolescent back talk is not a criminal threat. That is just a child engaging in adolescent aggressive speech, um, decriminalizing disorderly conduct among children, just, you know, uh, decriminalizing, you know, here's a perfect example. I mean, you know, when the book comes out, you know, a part one of the book, the entire part one offers up examples of, of things that we have just treated as, as crimes, like grabbing your teacher's hat and beginning to play catch among a group of kids in the classroom. Um, literally, I've seen charged as a robbery, okay? <laughs> you know, that's not a robbery. Or a young girl who snatches her boyfriend's cell phone while she's in an argument with him and walks away, that's been charged as a robbery. So these are examples, you know, thinking about how do we decriminalize some of what we've, um, we've, we've already criminalized. Um, and then I guess for those of you who wanna hear about other you know, police reforms. So look, if I'm not gonna talk about completely removing police from society, then what does reform look like? I mean, particularly reform for children. Um, I think it's about use of force regulations, right? Um, clear guidelines and mandates about what's appropriate in the physical handling um, and, and management of children. It's about um, in the District of Columbia, uh, just about a year ago, we had to legislate no handcuffing of children under 12. I think it's a tragedy that we had to legislate that, <laughs> you know, right? Um, there are very few children under 12 who are really gonna pose the kind of danger that a police officer can't manage shy of handcuffs and restraints. Um, other regulations we need uh, on um, when to, uh, you know, when to arrest the child versus when to call the parents. Um, we need uh, policy and regulation on mandatory de-escalation um, requirements for police officers dealing with children, um, prohibiting uh, consent searches. And I'm proud of some of my juvenile justice clinic students are in your course. And um, you know they've been working on some white papers and some testimony for our city council here in DC on how to prohibit um, consent searches for adolescents, prohibiting police officers from walking up to a child and asking them for permission to search them. A child is not in any position uh, to make a knowing, voluntary, and intelligent waiver, you know, or knowing and voluntary uh, a waiver of those kind of rights, um, prohibiting interrogation without counsel, um, other things like that. So there are a list of reforms um, that we need in the meantime um, until we radically reduce the footprint of police in the lives of children. And that, you know, uh, you're, you're mentioning the fact that some of the students in this course are working on a policy paper, uh, you know, to kind of alter, uh, you know, procedures in the District of Columbia is a, is a great example that kind of segues into our last topic, which is advice to students about what they, what they can and should be doing. Um, so actually, let me, uh, one question first. Um, you know, you share very difficult and heartbreaking stories of things you've encountered in your work. How do you balance your work with the need to maintain your own personal wellness? Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a, that's also a great question and one I get a lot. Um, you know, and I'll start by saying that, you know, if we don't take care of ourselves, then we're not gonna be in a position to help anybody. And so for those of you, you know, came to law school to make a difference, you gotta take care of yourself if you're gonna be able to, um, to do the work and to do the work for the long haul. Um, these jobs are hard. Um, you know, we're talking today about public defender jobs, legal aid jobs, prosecutors jobs. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, someone taught me the, the, the F's. I'm not sure if I remember exactly what their F's were, but mine are, you know, faith, fitness, family, friends, and fighting fatigue, right? So faith, fitness, family, friends, and fighting fatigue. And so faith is whatever that looks like for you, right? You know, so finding it within yourself um, to give you some perspective on the world, right? Um, you know, meditation, um, at grounding, 
um, you know, faith principles like this too shall pass, that there is a higher good and there's a higher order um, that we're all beholden to. So I think that's one. Um, fitness is, you know, taking care of yourself physically, right? Um, your physical health affects your, um, your mental health. Um, they're really, really intertwined. I mean, when I haven't worked out, you know, I get depressed <laughs> and everything looks bleak, right? So fitness is really important. Um, family, first things first right, is like understanding that like, you know, you were, you know, uh, uh, put in this in, in this world, not only to make a difference in the broader world, but you're put in this in, in this, you know, world as a part of a family. And so what does that look like? They're a source of support for you. Hopefully, you're a support source of support um, for them, hopefully. So, um, you know, there's resilience that comes with that. Friends is about socializing and laughing and also having, you know, I got to tell you, being a public defender, um, sometimes you come back to the office and all you want to do is cry. Um, and having like-minded friends, right, who you can share those moments with, who can help you get through those moments um, is really, really important. And then, you know, fighting fatigue is, is sort of my last one, which is getting rest, figuring out that there is a, you got to find time for respite whether that's vacation, whether that's sleeping nightly, you know, and I know everybody who's listening is laughing hysterically, like this is Chris Henning talking, <laughs> you know, I don't always keep these things in balance <laughs> myself, but I know what they are and I know that they are, that they are really important. Um, and then I'm gonna say the last thing that doesn't fit my F framework, <laughs> but it's ego management. And I had to learn this the, the hard way. Um, this is really important thing for, for balancing um, ego management is recognizing that you can't fix everything. And that, you know, at, for example, as a public defender, um, the, you are entering this child's life or this um, client's life at a moment, at a temporary moment. And you're going to be able to do what you can and give it all. And you're going to do your systemic reform, but you are just but one person, right? And you've got to let that, you know, your ego go and stop trying to fix everything. Um, but recognize, you know, we can't do too much. We've got to figure out what my calling is for this moment and do that. So. And that, that's really, that's what a terrific summary of uh, ways to support oneself you know, as you're, as you're fighting to, to do important work and fighting for justice. So that, that leads me to kind of my final summative question. So, you know, as, as we talked about, um, you know, I, I like to kind of have one question at the end that kind of draws things together. And then I'll say a few things about the end of the course, but uh, the final question is, it's clear from, and this is written by one of our students, uh, it's clear from reading your work and hearing you speak, that there are seemingly insurmountable issues in the criminal justice system and a lot of work that needs to be done to right the many injustices you speak about. Yet, in the face of all of that, you keep pushing forward and doing the work. What keeps you hopeful for the future and what motivates you to keep going? What a beautiful question and um, thank you to the student who asked it. Um, you know, I think my answer to that question is really um, all over the pages of, of the book and the excerpt that I gave you. I honestly, I do the work. I keep um, fighting against injustice um, for kids like Tariq, for Kevin, for Shauna, Sharice, for Tamir Rice, for Mike Brown, for Trayvon Martin, for Jeremiah Harvey, for Naya Kinney. I do it for every single young African-American kid that I write about. Um, uh, you know, in the same way that I wouldn't give up on my own kids, I wouldn't give up on my own flesh and blood. Um, I, I think if we start seeing um, young black kids as children and treating them the way we would treat our own children, um, then we're never gonna give it up. Um, I also though, I do, I think I stay in this work um, for every child um, who has stood up for themselves, right? And who stood up for themselves in a school board meeting, um, in a town hall gathering, in a protest march, in a city council hearing. Um, and I think the young people of the country today, you know, have, have demonstrated just an extraordinary, extraordinary resilience um, and activism in the face of um, tremendous oppression, adversity, um, and really state sanctioned violence. Um, and they need every single one of us to stand up for them. 
Um, they need every single one of us who has power, privilege, resource, opportunity, um, and, and, and really, quite frankly, the law degrees that we got um, from places like, you know, Georgetown, um, you know, to stand up and fight with them. And so that's what motivates me. And that's what gives me hope. It's the young people um, who are demonstrating resilience and who are demonstrating their own activism and giving voice to what they see as a better, you know, uh, way forward and a better world. And so um, I want to be the, right there with them. Um, and so that's what gives me hope. Wow. What an extraordinary end of the course. And I have to say, Professor Henning, you are, you inspire me. Yeah. And, and I know that you inspire our entire community. So, you know, as, as we're concluding this course about leadership, we couldn't have a finer, finer final speaker. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And that's a, a really powerful statement. I really appreciate it. I take it to heart. Um, having heard, you know, the seven other of my colleagues who have, um, who have spoken before me. So I thank you. I'm inspired by them. I'm inspired by you. And honestly, I'm inspired by our students at Georgetown. I, I absolutely, absolutely love teaching here. Um, and I love teaching in our clinical program. So I thank you to all my students who are out there and all of the future students who will come and, and work with me. So thank you, Bill. Thank you. So I just, uh, a few closing remarks, a few closing words, because I, I have to say, you know, I also find that our students are so inspiring and, um, you know, and, and to be able to talk to them and to present different faculty members and what they're doing is really a privilege. Um, you, know, the, you know, as I often say, the Law Center's motto is laws but the means, justice is the end. And there's never been a more important time to live out our motto, given all we're facing as a society. Uh, and it, as our students have seen from our remarkable speakers over the past eight sessions, there are many ways to be a leader, to make change, and to do good in society. And justice comes in many forms, from helping to form and build companies and employ people to working in juvenile justice. And Georgetown cares about all of them. So we're in a moment in time when our society is facing many challenges, including, for example, many different perspectives on the election. And we need to come together and make decisions and progress as a nation. And our students and the students on this course have a role to play as leaders in creating civil dialogue and helping each other to develop and learn. So, uh, you know, as we're drawing to a close, um, you know, what I'd like everybody to do is, you know, just take a few moments and think about what you've learned from this course and what it's meant for you. Uh, and I have to say, you know, as, as the conversation with Professor Henning today exemplifies, these have been very rich conversations. And, you know, the eight faculty members that we've heard, different ideologies, different paths they follow, different arenas, different passions. Um, you know, I have to say, you know, Professor Henning, it was really, it was so powerful to hear you talk about the way in which your aha moments you know, your focus on poverty, your focus on race, your focus on protecting juveniles, you know, and in different ways, uh, you know, I think everybody in the course has talked about what their aha moments are and, you know, how they've shaped them. And, and again, I think, you know, I'd like our students to think about what they, what they can reflect on from these aha moments. But I have to say, and, you know, and, and your, I love your, the, the five Fs, uh, that you closed with. Um, and I love, you know, you're talking about hope. Uh, and, you know, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking this morning um, about this course and, you know, all the faculty we've listened to and kind of what my takeaway from it is. Um, and for me, what I've taken away is the ways in which failure combined with grit and resilience make a great leader. Uh, grit is about the passion for the role and executing well, and resilience is the key to success. Uh, no matter, for all of our students, how you choose to use your law degree in the future, you're gonna encounter misses and mistakes. You're gonna have losses, and that's normal. And what will set you apart as a leader is how you pick yourself up 
how you brush yourself off and how you keep moving towards justice. So at the end of our last session, I asked Professor Edelman, who was a close advisor to Senator Kennedy, who was assassinated as he ran for president and who was a close advisor to President Clinton, but ultimately resigned from the administration because he disagreed with its policies about welfare. I asked him how you respond to loss. And he said, he said very simply, and I have to say, I won't, we'll never forget this. He said, you never give up. You keep on fighting. And, and you, Professor Henning, you know, I've heard you say so many times, we have to proceed with hope. And one of the best ways to approach a time like the one we find ourselves in is with activism. We lean in, we lead, we work to make change, and we hope. So for me, that's the central message of the course. Passion, grit, and resilience, and commitment to moving forward, even in the face of loss and adversity, that's what makes a great leader like you, Professor Henning. Lean in and hope in the future. So thank you again, Professor Henning. Thanks to all of our students. Thanks to everyone for a great semester. Take care. <laughs>